Welcome to Brain Ponderings. I'm Mark Matson, the host, and uh, today's topic is one that will be of broad interest to everyone uh, throughout the United States and the world, actually. And it has to do with uh, behavioral traits that can cause a lot of problems and what happens when an individual with these traits that can get caught disruptive behaviors, things that cause divisiveness and so on. Uh, what about when a person achieves a high level of power <laughs> over other people? So, um, and this has happened in the United States and we're experiencing it now. So my guest is Dr. Bandy Lee. She's a psychiatrist. She received her MD from Yale University, and then also did a Master's of Divinity of Yale. She did her uh, medical internships after medical school and, and residencies. And uh, well, the internship was at Bellevue Hospital in New York City. I kind of know about that place from a historical perspective. Like, I know a little bit about, I kind of like folk music and Bob Dylan and Woody Guthrie, and he was actually a patient at Bellevue Hospital, and I think he was misdiagnosed as having schizophrenia when he actually had Huntington's disease, which actually caused some behavioral symptoms. But anyway, Dr. Lee then did a residency at Mass General, which is Harvard Hospital, and then went back to Yale for a long time. She was uh, on the faculty there. Uh, so... Dr. Lee, you want to talk a little bit about your background? You, I understand you were born in New York and grew up in the Bronx. Is that right? Well, I grew up mostly in the Bronx, but uh, actually my earliest days I, I spent in Boston uh, oh, really? for a couple of years and then moved to the New York area and grew up, uh, yes, in, in the most um, dangerous areas, I guess. Uh, at a time when New York was one of the most dangerous cities in the country. So that's how I came to study violence. Um, I was always interested in it from a behavioral perspective, as well as uh, interested in the mind and the brain. So yeah. uh, that's how I became uh, a psychiatrist. I, I come from a do family of doctors for yeah. about two generations. And I was told that, um, well, internists, know a lot and can't do very much while <laughs> surgeons do a lot but don't know very much oh my god psychiatrists don't know very much and can't do very much so why go into this field but yeah I... it, it's that's true i it's interesting even even neurosurgeon like neurosurgeons well i don't want to bash neurosurgeons but they don't know a lot about the brain, actually. <laughs> they don't necessarily <laughs> yes, I, have to, right? Uh, yes. Okay. I, 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 I do consider it a rather um, crude intervention for uh, at least uh, even for psychiatric issues or, or neuropsychiatric yeah. issues, I'd uh, say. Used, um, used to be common. Psychiatry. Yes. Frontal low Psychiatry level. turns out to be a fascinating field, so I've never regretted it. Well, it is. It's very fascinating. And there's there's been you know a good amount of progress over the years in in treating patients. And I think the future is bright, although it's a complicated situation, right? Where you have we've had over the years big changes in society and Kids nowadays, they, you know, so I have two kids, they're older now. My son's finishing up his PhD at Hopkins and my daughter's actually a photographer, but they, they, they're bombarded with so much information and getting these little sound bites of information. And my impression now is kids today don't read books as much, you know, they don't sit down for hours and hours you know, being exposed to things in detail. And then they don't spend a lot of time just thinking, I, I, it seems like to me. And I don't yes, think- Yes, I would agree. I, just from general observation that uh, 
children and we even as adults don't explore enough, don't play enough, and uh, don't experiment enough in ways that would d develop a lot of those traits that make one a healthier, uh, a mentally healthier person. So I, I do worry about that sometimes. And I, I agree with you, even psychiatry itself. Uh, we often say that at one time it was brainless, but now it's mindless. And <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, it's become a rather obtuse field in my perspective during the course of my career. Yeah. And the internet's causing a lot of problems with it, with algorithms. And it, there's this one phrase, I, I can't remember where I saw it recently that, you know, so this podcast, right, we spend an hour and we'll get into details on, you know, what is psychopathic behavior? What are the criteria and so on? Uh, you know, so we spend an hour going over this and but like the most popular things on the internet are things where they don't go into a lot of detail and it's kind of um you have these personalities unlike me that are very charismatic and so on and so this phrase i heard recently is popularity is the hallmark no, no mediocrity is the hallmark of popularity <laughs> And it's kind of true when, you know, that our society is kind of gravitating, and I think the algorithms are doing this a lot, towards things that are, not, there, a lot of it may be misinformation or not good information, and it's things that are kind of stirring up your emotions and, and making you, uh, making people like, this divisiveness, the divisiveness thing is really a big problem, right? Where, and and I think that's one. Some I didn't really see it in the the, the hair. There's this hair psychopathy checklist. Maybe let's let's just go through that as long as we do it. So I've got them here, and of course you got a lot of pushback from the American Psychological Association. And eventually got essentially got let go by Yale just because you were essentially, again, there's a huge amount of data on Donald Trump. We see it every day. We've seen so many speeches, so many terrible things he's done. Even before he was elected in 2016, he would make fun of uh, disabled people and and denigrate women. And, and you no, know, there's people that are okay with that and voted for him. But let's go through these. So glibness and superficial charm. Okay. Egocentricity. Okay, so that's obvious. Uh, narcissism. The, the delusions of grandeur, I think, used to be a term that I don't know if psychiatrists used, right? Yes, um, they still use it. Pathological lying. That's a no-brainer. Every time he talks, is <laughs> something. Uh, but then, you know, conning, lack of sincerity. You know, he he's in trouble now for a lot of things. But even before that, you know, he had this bogus Trump University that gave out bogus degrees for, you know, and he got had to pay back a lot of money for that. One of the key thing, two couple of key things are lack of empathy. I mean, uh, one thing my dad told me a long time ago is like, when you're voting for someone, you know, you're, you're hiring them, and and you're inter you're interviewing the person not directly, but you know through what they say, you're interviewing the person, and so ask yourself with the question if if you were you know, in a position you're hiring someone and this person applied for the position, would you hire them? Right? And and would you hire someone who has clearly no empathy, they're they're divisive and so on. So you want to talk a little bit about that? And then we'll we'll, yes. we'll, we'll go on. Okay. <laughs> First of all, 
Uh, let me say I agree with you in that we as uh, psychiatrists, mental health professionals, we know more about Donald Trump probably than any of uh, the patients we've ever treated. That's what my Harvard colleagues have said, that uh, there's simply so much information over extended periods of time that there's really no comparison with any patient we've ever treated. That said, uh, diagnosing a person as a patient is, uh, is an entirely different matter than assessing their fitness for office yeah. and their dangerousness. As you can clearly see, the first has to do with treating them as an individual, as a private patient, and that comes with patient confidentiality. You don't divulge any information without getting right. their consent. Um, but in the latter situation, in a fitness test or dangerousness test, um, it that's a public concern and has nothing to do with diagnosis. And actually, it's not really what the so-called Goldwater Rule was intended to do. Uh, the Goldwater Rule uh, is actually kind of a caveat to a larger uh, affirmative obligation that psychiatrists participate in activities that improve the community and better public health. Yeah. That's Section 7 of the Ethical Code. Also, um, we... Uh, the ethics code has in its preamble, uh, it clarifies that we have a responsibility to patients, certainly, first and foremost, but we also have a responsibility as well as to society. Yeah. And uh, so what the American Psychiatric Association did at the start of Trump presidency was to redefine the Goldwater Rule to make it uh, what many of us call a gag order, because it was supposed to be a guideline, first educate the public yeah. for the betterment of public health, but don't diagnose a public figure as if they were your personal yeah. patient, uh, which we would never uh, do. Uh, in fact, I don't believe you can do. Uh, Isn't it true though that like if, if you're you're seeing an you know, individual patient and they, you know, they have some background of hostility or violence and they, they tell you, I'm going to murder this person. Don't you have some responsibility to report that? Yes, yeah. absolutely. In fact, yeah. there are many ways in which a public person could become a patient. Uh, for example, when you go out uh, in the middle of the public and of course you uh, know that uh, any physician who encounters somebody who is, um, uh, uh, you know, um, having a heart attack or or has fallen, and people are looking for a doctor, then you have an obligation to respond yeah. and treat. Yeah. Well, the, the equivalent in psychiatry is if someone is a danger to the public for yeah. psychological reasons, they they become your patient. You have to you have to intervene and treat. Uh, once uh, and and also in private situations, uh, a patient may divulge to you in ways that no one else would be able to detect that they are intending to hurt someone, uh, kill someone. Then you do have a duty to warn and protect. Yeah. Um, so uh, the duty that we have, well, we have a primary duty to protect, to warn and protect the public when it's in danger regardless of whether or not a public figure is our patient, but we also could intervene as, as if they were a patient uh, when they are a danger to society. So there are multiple obligations that we have. But first and foremost, our obligation to society. We have a primary obligation to society, just as we do to, to patients. Yeah. So, uh, so when someone is posing a danger, you don't really need a diagnosis. You don't need to see them yeah. as a personal patient. In fact, once you do a personal interview, they become your patient and it becomes more complicated because you're bound by patient confidentiality. But when, when you're simply observing them based on publicly available information and you're simply bringing sure. your knowledge and clinical experience to that in information, that's no different than legal scholars commenting on on uh, the Constitution or uh, on his 
uh, on Donald Trump's legal problems. Uh, there's a dis there's a distinction as a as a lawyer, you don't have to personally represent him and get personal permission to be able to speak about him in public. And that's where the APA, the American Psychiatric Association, misled the public. Yeah. And I believe did so rather deliberately. Um, it went on a very uh, aggressive public relations campaign to promote this very obscure Goldwater rule that was considered basically out of date since it was in the books in the early 70s. And by 1980, we diagnosed by observation behavior more than by personal interviews. So it was already obsolete. Um, and, and we know as a result of their disinformation campaign, as I call it, they've received uh, unprecedented windfalls of federal funding. So uh, that's, huh. that's where wow. I feel that uh, when, Dur during during the Trump administration, are they still yes. are they still receiving that from? No, from, no, no. Since then, their funding has fallen. But during the Trump administration, when uh, there have been studies uh, published in the Journal of the AMA, the JAMA, um, that uh, the Trump administration, almost without exception, cut funding to scientific organizations, except. Yeah those that were willing to go against science. Mm -hmm. So the fact that the APA was one of uh, huge ben beneficiaries to the point where they moved their headquarters from Arlington, Virginia, to the center of Washington, DC, shoulder to shoulder with Washington lobbyists, tell you what was behind their uh, promotion of this Goldwater rule that had nothing to do with uh, the scholarly advances in the field. In fact, it was a, a guideline that was going more and more out of uh, out of relevance. Uh, and in fact, uh, ethical scholars were loosening uh, the guideline and scientific, well, from scientific and clinical standpoint, it was uh, no longer relevant since 1980. So why did they come out and uh, make such a public uh, display of its reaffirmation, which wasn't really a reaffirmation, it was a redefinition into uh, something that had no resemblance to the former Goldwater rule. The former Goldwater rule was, as I said, educate the public, but just don't diagnose a public figure. Uh, the new definition was don't say anything about any aspect of a public figure, not just diagnosis or professional opinion, but any aspect of them, unless you've done a personal examination and gotten personal uh, authorization from them, which of course, in the case of precisely the individuals that would be of public concern, critical concern, those who are dangerous and those who are unfit would yeah. almost inevitably refuse an interview and refuse consent. And uh, there are many government positions that where where the person in the position it's a potential for the person the person to do dangerous things. Violent military is a good example, right? Yes. That, that where there is psychological evaluation uh, of the people when they're applying for the position or whatever we. You know, we didn't really have that where I was, but you know, we worked with mice and rats and stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> but what we, what I would always do, you know, I'd get someone CV, interview them, but what, and get letters of recommendation. But I wouldn't just rely on that. I would always talk one to one with the former employer of that person and say. Does this person get along with others? You know, actually, I learned the hard way way back early on. You know, I hired someone as a postdoc who she caused a lot of trouble. You know, she didn't get along with people. She'd talk back to them. Even the director of the place I was at, she was yelling at and stuff. And you know, so the. It's it's very important. I think most people don't want to hire someone who causes a lot of trouble, right? Uh, right. So, so but it doesn't apply test. to the president. 
Yes. Uh, I mean, that's why, especially those who are handling uh, military equipment, uh, nuclear yeah. arsenals, are required to undergo fitness tests before they are even yeah. given the position. Yeah. And uh, those handling nuclear weapons are supposed to re uh, renew rigorous psychological testing every year. But the person who commands those weapons is not required to undergo any uh, any standardized test. And, um, so, and they don't really have to have any quality. Actually, considering the job and what's involved, candidates don't have to have any experience. They don't have to have any knowledge of our experience in the like the job duties that they're going to perform. You know, it's, it's just like in this case, it's like a popularity thing, and and the popularity seemed to arose by. There's a lot of people that like to see, I guess, people made fun of, and and this kind of us versus them mentality, and uh, which is kind of scary, right? I I I, I can, and probably you can't. I mean, you maybe you can because you're a psychiatrist, but I can't understand why people would vote for someone with this kind of a trait and and, and yes. no no experience yes uh in fact that's one of the dangers of uh making a presidential campaign a purely uh a popularity contest um without any checks and balances or any standards. Uh, that's why it's so anomalous that we yeah. don't have the standard of fitness for a president the way we do for every other job and every other task. We don't require it, require it always in advance. But when we find that someone, uh, yeah. a person is always presumed uh, to have the capacity to carry out their job or any task until they start showing signs that they are not. Mm -hmm. At which point, usually, uh, you have you remove that person from that task or job and require them to undergo a fitness test before they resume. Yeah. But in the case of the president, we did have some uh, measures in place such as the 25th amendment and impeachment and that's the reason for which i was uh, consulted by over 50 congress members soon after i held the uh, conference with uh, luminaries such as robert j lifton judith herman and james gilligan uh, at yale school of medicine uh, congress members started to consult us and invite us to uh, speak with us and uh and, and they were seriously thinking of the 25th Amendment because that is based on mental inability or, or any kind of inability to carry out one's duties. And um, But again, the APA and some past APA presidents, uh, very connected with their funding sources, it seems, um, again, stated that uh, psychiatrists have no role based on the Goldwater rule. We're not supposed to consult with uh, Congress members, whereas in fact, uh, ethical guidelines section 7.2, uh, 7.1, which comes before 7.3, the Goldwater rule, explicitly says that in order to serve the public, we should consult with the executive judici judiciary and um, legislative mm -hmm. branches of the government. So <laughs> it doesn't make sense what they were saying in public. Uh, even John Then, Well, well this is on my mind. Did you know? So the the situation with Israel and the Palestinians, and then the president of University of Pe Pennsylvania had to resign, be, and it had to do with rich donors to the university uh, saying, "We're not. I'm not going to give you any more money if you keep this person in that position." Do you know if any of that went on with Yale's decision with you? Well, many people say that it absolutely did because um, I was even affirmed in uh, the chair of psychiatry 
John Crystal's State of the Department address uh, following my speaking in public and becoming, actually, I, I and my colleagues were the number one topic of national conversation about three months after the publication yeah. of our book, The Dangerous So, so your, your, chair, your chair supported you? He supported me in public in, in front of the whole so department. It was whatever, Dean. And he, that was in 2018 uh, when... Uh, and, and he affirmed that the department and the school and the university uh, supported academic freedom. Yeah. But two years later, when uh, Alan Dershowitz suddenly contacted uh, John Crystal and the dean of Yale Law School, where I was teaching, uh, basically asking them to uh, to penalize me for uh, abrogating the Goldwater rule, which they don't really have jurisdiction over anyway. It's mm -hmm. only an APA guideline, and I wasn't an APA member uh, at that point, which is why they couldn't really investigate me. Um, I had resigned back in 2007 because of their excessive pharmaceutical industry funding. And mm -hmm. uh, about a third of their funding had been coming from the pharmaceutical industry. And I felt that their policies reflected that. So I resigned. So I was not under their guidelines. And no other mental health association has the Goldwater rule. In fact, uh, it only applies to 6% of mental health professionals. And yet, um, Yale took it upon itself not to affirm academic freedom, but to enforce uh, a guideline that I was no longer under because of Alan Dershowitz's complaint. And it, the response was immediate. Within less than 48 hours, his complaint was responded to. And uh, I, who had um, nothing but uh, the top evaluations yeah. from faculty, students, yeah. and uh, nothing had changed in terms of my academic performance, I continued to be not only uh, acceptable, but the top uh, uh, ranking in terms of my scores, uh, my undergraduate classes, my law school classes, and so on. So the only change was that Dershowitz made a complaint. And we don't know why, but I'm obviously not the first. There's a, a high profile um, person, I think his name is uh, Norman Finkelstein, who was removed from his tenure, uh, already granted tenure position um, because of Alan Dershowitz's complaint uh, at that time over Israel. But there have been a number of faculty who have been removed based on his complaints. And so uh, people don't really know. It could be funding. It could be political backing. But uh, we know that that has happened a number of times. And in my case, there couldn't be nothing else that could be point, pointed to. And the fact that uh, the chair of my department and the head of my division, whom I was close to, had uh, interacted with every day for decades, suddenly stopped communicating with me as if they could not divulge the real reason why they were letting me go. And I requested, uh, the first time they asked to meet with me, I requested a discussion. I felt that perhaps a good thing that could come out of this was that uh, the Goldwater Rule would finally be discussed. Uh, the APA would finally be exposed for its distortion of ethics and its uh, going contrary to science and prevailing practice. But no discussion happened. And I was not even given a reason as to why I was let go. It took many months and almost a year of trying to communicate with them and contact them as to the reason why I was let go, that finally I got a letter from Don Crystal saying that it was because of the Goldwater rule. The, uh, the head of the American um, Association of University Professors wrote to the university saying they were violating uh, the guidelines of, that they recommend for such uh, letting go based on um, based on public speech, and yet uh, Yale did not respond. And um, uh, unfortunately, even our legal system is not 
so robust anymore that my attempts to get discovery through a lawsuit uh, did not succeed. Um, in fact, many were watching my lawsuit because uh, of Dershowitz's involvement and, and potential donor involvement yeah. that uh, that was this would be very revealing. But I think a lot has already been revealed since. Uh, Yale has since let go of uh, a number of prominent professors in multiple departments based on donor, uh, explicitly known donor pressures. And now we know the president of UPenn, the president of Harvard. It seems that no one, no position is safe from the pressures of, uh, of powerful uh, influences. Um, getting back to Trump, so he's uh, got a lot of criminal versatility, right? That fits in the psychopathic behavior. He doesn't just, you know, rob stores. He likes to do a lot of different crimes and doesn't take any responsibility for anything he does. Uh, clearly doesn't show any remorse. He, he doesn't care who he hurts. I mean, look, at, so you mentioned New York City, right? You used to have a lot of crime when you were young and growing up. And then Rudy Giuliani had, you know, some people didn't like his approach, but he, as a mayor, he played an important role in reducing crime in New York City. I would contradict that. Would you contradict <laughs> that? As a, as a scholar of violence, and as a New Yorker who watched what he did, what he did was he, uh, the crime rate was already decreasing and it was decreasing because of a lot of social programs and unemployment oh. going down oh. and uh, a lot of community activism that was actually incredibly uh, widespread in, in New York City at that point. There were gardening projects, art projects and, and a lot of community improvement work. What he did was come in at the end of that <laughs> uh, okay. that wave uh, and to take credit for it. And okay. he he touted uh, rigorous policing. He, um, yeah, the stop and he search. did some good prosecutorial work, such as uh, turn in all his relatives and and acquaintances in, in the Italian mafia that was, <laughs> that was. Um, the, the reason I mentioned his name, obviously, in case of Trump and, and Trump's psychopathic behavior is that Trump, he, he's just destroyed so many people's lives, right? You've got, yes. you know, with the, the federal trial on trying to overturn the election and then in Georgia, already in Georgia, several of them pleaded guilty and you know Giuliani's lost all his money. He's like, I think some of it has to do with, I don't know. That was, but anyway, so this is another kind of feature of these people with these when they have an extreme psychopathic behavior. They don't care about anybody, and they throw them under the bus. They con them into doing things in the case of Giuliani and the others around him, uh, other lawyers and so on, uh, you know, kind of in the, <laughs> promulgating his falsehoods and, and kind of, I don't know, inventing evidence or making up things that aren't true, like uh, this election worker was, I don't know what she, they accused her of doing, you know, taking secret ballot, you know, hiding ballots or taking a suitcase outright. And and so fortunately, you know, they've gotten a lot of money and for just destroying their lives. But the point is, you can have one person that's this in kind of a domino effect, destroying lives, you know, he, he, cause, he somehow causes people to do illegal things or, or do things defame, you know, people. And then, so you get this domino effect of, you know, just destruction, I guess you could say, destroying people's lives. Does that start yes. when these, one thing about this is like, we always talk about genes and environment and what's the, you know, so presumably when 
he he grew up and he's kind of had these traits early on and maybe he was uh i don't know what the role of his parents are they just let him do what he want but can you talk a little bit about the early life environment and propensity to these kind of behavioral traits that can lead to violence and lead to destruction of the lives around the people with these traits? Yes, in, in general terms, uh, we know that psychopathy, which is characterized by lack of uh, empathy, conscience, and um, um, kind of uh, destructive behavior uh, driven by uh, a kind of emotional need to harm others. And, um, and they present extremely well. Uh, you mentioned conning. They manipulate the minds of others to see them as, as uh, ideal persons for the job, for the, uh, as a family member, as, um, as a friend, a colleague. But in truth, um, they're the opposite. Uh, they, um, well, Harvey Cleckley, who uh, uh, first did a prominent um, explanation of psychopathy in his Mask of Sanity, uh, he described it as uh, wreaking more havoc than all other psychiatric conditions combined. Mm -hmm. So in truth, these mm -hmm. individuals are highly debilitated, but by using this compensatory mechanism of uh, manipulating others to get their way and presenting themselves extremely well mm -hmm. as being very capable or very uh, uh, very personable or yeah. uh, being the ideal kind of person you would wish to relate to, that is all a trick of the mind. And so um, knowing that such a condition exists, first of all, is important. So that's where mental health experts who have studied this come in. Um, as to how much is genetic versus environmental, uh, you know, as you know, the boundaries have blurred over the decades. Yeah. Um, but uh, there's thought to be a considerable genetic component to it. But early trauma, um, early uh, abandonment, especially, and neglect so they don't really have to be um physically uh or even sexually um uh, abused in order for this to happen neglect and abandonment uh, seem to play also a large role if not a greater role uh, we know that in donald trump's case he was essentially abandoned by his mother at age two and a half when she was hospitalized after um, a bleeding incident uh, carrying his younger brother. She was not available. Uh, his father was certainly not emotionally available uh, or uh, even worse, uh, had psychopathic traits himself. So, um, so it, it tends to, uh, th that kind of trauma propagates through time. So uh, one can also see it as an, a restation of development at the time of trauma, and he at two and a half years old, that would be um, at a stage when one thinks of the world in terms of uh, uh, power is what keeps you safe, might makes right, and you will do anything and uh, bulldoze that over anyone to be able to get that power because you're so busy protecting yourself so it's the the, yeah. ter the terrible twos on steroids if you're <laughs> yes <laughs> that's right <laughs> huh yeah and then then you have you know his, his father was rich left him a lot of money and so he has kind of the means to to uh i, I don't know what by people's friendship or by people's allegiance to i don't know if this is i'm just kind of speculating but does that sound right uh yes and and also the feeling that um if you have uh power and uh money and 
uh, political connections, you can do whatever you wish. And uh, so his father was very uh, oppressive and had harmful practices against minority groups. He himself was uh, in in some kind of demonstration with the Ku Klux Klan. And uh, mm -hmm. so Donald Trump carrying on uh, that that disposition would be unsurprising. He's, uh, of course, gone much further, much further in terms of attaining power and exploiting power. Uh, he uh, is certainly responsible for, we think, more than a million American deaths already, not to mention uh, destabilization of the world, leading to many international war wars, uh, uh, the, the, the million, the million of the world deaths, order. Is, it, is that mostly the mismanagement of the COVID and mismanagement of COVID and the emboldening of brutal dictators uh, yeah. around the world, uh, specific policies that he had with Israel and Russia that emboldened them to uh, launch wars once he was out of office, um, the way he stoked uh, white supremacist terrorism across the world, or the way he uh, polarized this nation in ways that uh, brought us to a brink of civil war, uh, the way he um, gutted uh, institutions in ways that uh, they no longer function well and, um, and weakening the institutions of democracy, if so not... The uh, almost overthrow it. <laughs> so the January 6th, so I was working when that was happening, but I went back and looked at, you know, they had video of what happened throughout the whole day. And so it started out, so you get all these people coming from all over the country, you know, that are on board with him and listening to what he says coming to DC. And then, then they have, this is the thing that really bothered I bought everything bothered me but about that day. But so in the morning they have these prayer sessions, right? So these are the I guess Christians in name only. I don't know what else to say about it, but so they have these prayer sessions and you know they're they're praying that Trump gets, you know, restored as president. It's just crazy. And then you know, he Trump speaks and the others and these many of these same people who say they're Christians, they they go to the Capitol, they beat up the police, you know, have a lot of violence, damaging the building, trespassing, you know, calling for the death of whatever, you know, Democrats and so on. So what what do you think? You know, that's another aspect of this whole thing that doesn't make sense to me. You've got a person that his behaviors are like the opposite of what Jesus would say is good, right? And then you have the people who say that they're, they're the most devout Christians that are happy with that and vote for them. And then, so what... You know, religion, in a sense, can you talk about the, the psychology of religious sort of behaviors and stuff and how that relates to being able to, this person be able to, I, I don't know, that it just doesn't make sense to me. What's your evaluation of that? Well, it shows the power of the mind to yeah. distort just about anything. Yeah. Uh, there are ways in which religion could make you free. Uh, at least Christianity in the uh, in America has been used uh, as a basis for the American Revolution, for the civil rights movement, unlike Europe, which uh, specifically uh, divorced itself from religion, its um, enlightenment activities. Uh, so it can be freeing, uh, but it also can be um, can be oppressive, destructive, and be responsible for the greatest atrocities in history, um, uh, as well as 
be used in a kind of cult-like manner, a uh, cult-like function to prime individuals to be um, members of a personality cult such as Donald Trump's. Yeah, take scale, massive scale. I, I was listening to a song the other day. Joan Baez was singing, singing one of Bob Dylan's song uh, with God on our side. And it's essentially saying, you have these you have these wars, and both, you know, both sides say God's with us, you know, and it's kind of a justification in a way, uh, you know, to to do this. So it's yeah, it's really yes. God is God is a, a perfect um, uh, image to which we would project our emotional needs and. And in fact, uh, in impairments. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what about research on this? So, I, you know, I don't know what you, uh, some of the journal articles that, so I just may basically go on PubMed for most of my information, but they do have obviously a lot of psychiatry stuff in there. There's a recent paper. So there's been some analysis on this division that Trump is, you know, there was division already, but not on this scale at all, you know, red versus blue and and so on. But, you know, and then we have the media with Fox News where there's a lot of, of people who that's all they watch. And so that's their reality. There's this paper in Nature Human Behavior well, it's 2022. So they looked at uh, red versus blue counties throughout. There's data on this throughout the the country. What, how did county vote? It's, it's red, blue. We're we're actually one of the few red counties in Maryland. But uh, I'm not red. I'm blue. Anyway. So they found that explicit racial and religious prejudice increased significantly amongst Trump supporters, but individuals opposed to Trump exhibited decreases in prejudice. You know, so um, so this is another thing that is causing a lot of problems that, you know, uh, racial issues and um right you know women women's rights you know the abortion issue and stuff so there's increasing polarization there that's definitely happened well it comes out of donald trump's uh psychological structure uh he has a need to denigrate uh those who any, everybody, in order to elevate him and counteract uh, the, the pervasive and intolerable sense of inadequacy and worthlessness within him. So it's, it's an overcompensation, uh, but that also translates into disdain for, uh, if not absolute contempt and the need to destroy uh, those who are in weakened positions or mm -hmm. vulnerable groups in society, mm -hmm. such as minorities or women. So that's going to play out. Uh, the reason why his psychology so spreads and, and was able to mobilize such a, uh, such a large group on January 6th uh, is because of a phenomenon I call Trump contagion but it really is emotional contagion, which is well known in neuroscience as well, yeah. uh, in that um, there, uh, uh, people take on others' uh, uh, behaviors, uh, mental states, even physiology uh, uh, through emotional bonds and exposure. And, um, and that uh, when there is pathology, and, and I do make a distinction between states of health and pathology because simply because well as a physician my paradigm has to do with health versus disease but once you enter into the realm of disease then um then your drive is to become destructive and and 
your own drives head in the direction of death versus life affirming choices, which are um, uh, which are always uh, trending toward uh, health and um, survival. So, um, so what happens is that uh, in in cases of uh, widespread emotional contagion, especially at the level at the primitive level of yeah. disease, uh, then uh, it's not that each individual who takes on the symptoms develop an individual disorder, but it, as a collective, um, they take on the symptoms of the primary person who is uh, who yeah. is in such an influential mm -hmm. position. And, and so that's that's a part that is very dangerous. And it will know no end, meaning well, uh, and, and the thing that we... you know people uh, you know with, within your your neighborhood or you know your small social groups, people want to be part of the group, right? And so uh -huh. you get get this amplification, you know, so we we would drive and this is like in 20 it's crazy there's still houses you know there's certain pockets where there are still you drive and there are still trump signs you know vote for trump or whatever from the well from the 2020 election but also you know they had it's just kind of weird to me, but but anyway, you get this. Well, I I, I uh, stated in my second book on Trump, uh, Profile of a Nation, Trump's Mind, America's Soul, uh, that uh, without proper intervention, meaning psychiatrically informed intervention, because of the nature of the phenomenon, that the Trump presidency would not end. And in fact, uh, the, that's what I said before the election, uh, election or not, the Trump presidency will not end. And in the mind of many, uh, in the minds of many, that's what happened. His yeah. presidency has continued and they cannot even conceive of any other presidency that he has to be the one. And no matter what kind of criminal indictments come forth or the um, or, or uh, criminal deeds become revealed, it does not matter. The fact that he is the one is uh it's is not, not yeah now he's he's the victim he's made it you know somehow that turn it around so that he's a victim rather than the perpetrator yes that's what perpetrators do in fact i've worked in maximum security prisons all my career and when you walk into these uh these prisons you never find a perpetrator everyone is a victim uh, yeah. they have all been acting in self-defense. It doesn't matter how vulnerable or how uh, helpless their victim was, they were defending themselves. And uh, that's the kind of psychology that is actually dangerous. It's not the actual situation that makes a person violent, it's their perception of the situation and paranoia, which is exaggerated yeah. threat or believing there is a threat when none exists, yeah. that makes individuals most violent yeah you mentioned that it, you know among the myriad of bad things that he'd done to promote this uh, divisiveness is that you know he'd say the immigrants are threats to you uh uh what was it um well what's the uh anti-fascism uh, anyway you know he may, makes it like you should worry that there's these people coming in and they're gonna come in and take all your things and destroy your lives and and then he even makes it the the democratic party like that they're they're gonna take away your now it's what are your, your gas stove your you know whatever uh you know, so stoking all those uh, fears actually resonates with a population that's already predisposed and already uh, has been conditioned to look at the world in terms of threats and fear. 
And, and that's what uh, Donald Trump is grabbing onto. That's why demagogues succeed in times of uh, collective crises, uh, societal crises, where people are uh, deprived and they will re revert back, regress to a mindset that thinks of the world as threatening, as uh, beyond their control, where they are powerless and they would uh, like to uh, ally themselves with a powerful leader. So they're actually, because of the regression to an earlier stage of development, they're actually looking for a parental figure. So it's kind of like a parent-child relationship that they're looking for. They're not looking for democracy. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay. Well, we've covered a lot of ground in a short amount of time. Is there anything, what do you see for the future and what, how, how would, I don't know who, psychiatrists work, is there any potential for the somehow, uh, so I'm a big Carl Sagan fan, right? Back and back in the '80s, he testified before the Senate about, you know, the what's going to happen with climate change, global warming, and you know, potential devastating consequences. And one thing he said is that this combustible mixture of ignorance and power is going to blow up in our face. And so. Congressmen and senators, virtually none of them, I guess there are a few that have medical degrees, but that for the most part, they have no background in science and in how how to evaluate whether, you know, what is probability versus uh, possibility. And uh, I think that basic knowledge is really important in making decisions. So they don't have really a uh, skills base to be making decisions that should be based on the evidence and you know what's the most likely based on the evidence to be the best path forward yes absolutely so do, you, do you think there's any way to how, how do you go i don't see how, how to change that and as we mentioned earlier people getting elected a lot of it has to do with the popularity contest which has nothing to do with, does this person have the skills to make informed decisions? Do they know how to evaluate data and you know compare data from different places and so on? So this is a huge problem. And, and, and now that there's another thing Trump did, right? He's got this anti-science thing kind of snowballing, right, where uh, you know, don't listen. It's to, not just anti-science. It's now anti-truth. And yeah. um, evidence-based politics would be very good. <laughs> yeah. But how to get there? I don't have much faith in psychiatry as a profession, but psychiatry could contri potentially contribute a great deal. Um, in my textbook, Violence, I even cite uh, humanity's tendency as being a collective suicidal tendency at this time, given yeah. what we're doing with nuclear weapons and the environment. Um, and, and that was the direction in which we are headed, uh, in large part because of the mental unfitness of leaders and uh, oh, their yeah. unwillingness. And all of the, most of the leaders no matter who they are, they are always thinking in the short term and, you know, uh, prom you know promising something that's going to help, you know, a certain group of people, like, right away. And they don't, you know, their election cycles or whatever, four years or two years for, and, you know, and and so they're, they all just want to get elected. So they're just saying, well, you know, what, what can I do for people that'll, you know, you get like instant gratification and there's no, you get this turnover and there's no long-term thinking. It's really very, it's kind of foreign to scientists, but. <laughs> yes, that's right. 
because it's so clear in the data and we yeah. have so much uh, information as to solutions and there are lots of solutions available, yeah. but the politicians won't do them and they're fearful of them because of uh, unpopularity or uh, lack of immediate results or what have you. And they find it much more expedient to simply gain popularity to the point where it's now a frenzied uh, massive shared psychosis that they are using even as a political strategy. So uh, I, I think, well, first of all, our government lacks an independent panel of experts the way that many other mm -hmm. governments have. And um, also uh, the, the public is not educated. Right. Uh, when we try to educate the yeah. public, when in fact we were considered kind of a fluke in that coming out with our, our book, The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, we were catapulted to the number one topic of national conversation. I was on news programs 15 hours a day, every single day, and um, and was not in, uh, there was not a major news program I was not invited to uh, until the American Psychiatric Association stepped in and oh. essentially blacked us out from the media. And I think that is very- Wait, wait a minute, what about Fox? Were you on Fox? Uh, yes, I actually had uh, a very extensive interview oh. that was a profile of me. And I was very impressed. Uh, oh. It was all recorded and I was uh, very excited that they would do such a thing that was beyond my expectation of what was within Fox's yeah. realm of willingness to do, uh, but it never aired. It never aired. Uh, ah. It never aired. That's too bad. But it's not just Fox. It's uh, I've been invited at over 70 times onto CNN and MSNBC. No, no, no. But I'm just wondering, you know, from the right wing versus... Yes, you know. no, the... the you, 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 no you wouldn't think you wouldn't think like Fox would want to have someone saying, "Oh, Trump's a, got all, all these psychological problems, right?" Right, right. But even the so-called left-wing media or the mainstream media, the New York Times deleted my quotes in twelve articles, huh. only my quotes. Um, and, and they were the ones who came out with the editorial stating that psychiatrists shouldn't talk about their area of expertise, that they had no business doing so. And later we found out it was the APA that was behind it, meeting with the editorial board and convincing them to publish such an article. But yeah. that was when everything stopped. And whereas before I was impressed at the level of uh, our yeah. general enlightenment toward mental health issues, I thought in the beginning there was absolutely no stigma. I thought when I was being invited to all these programs that and being treated as an expert just like any other area, I thought that the decades of mental health awareness campaigns had finally uh, brought us to that point. But with the APA's wand of uh, the Goldwater Rule, everything stopped, and we have a greater stigma than ever before. Yeah, there, you know, there's a, there's a lot of uh, interest, and in the media covers a lot now the kind of mental health crisis with regards to individuals having yes the depression or severe anxiety, which seems to be. Or not, it is according to the data on the increase in young adults, uh, young women. Yes, um, I, it's about time we've uh, encountered uh, no such crisis in modern times to this level. And yeah. uh, it, it's rather late in our speaking about it, but I'm, I'm glad there is some discussion. And, and maybe this goes back to what we talked about early on the the environment the kids are growing up in now and what they're exposed to and uh, the simple thing like I mean we evolve with we I'm we have like two and a half acres where we live in Maryland so I look out my window there's woods right trails and we evolved in that kind of environment where you know it's relatively quiet things aren't happening very fast. You aren't getting bombarded with all sorts of information. You can kind of think about 
things in, in a slower, more deliberate manner. And our brains, you know, the, the circuitry we evolved in that environment, there's no way we're going to change that. It's going to change that quickly by evolutionary mechanisms to be able to deal with the current bombardment of sensory information. So it's uh, that has to be an important contributor to that. Yes. Yeah. Yes, stress and the need for denial uh, will be prominent factors. You know, I think... It, so there has been some, there's still a, a couple hunter-gatherer societies, uh, Hazda and a few others in Africa, and they have kind of this egalitarian type. You know, they're only groups of maybe 100, right? And, and so everybody knows everybody in the group from the time they're, you know, they're little kids on up, and, and they'll have, uh, it's kind of like a communal thing, I guess, so that... You know, it's not this, the, the different uh, parents will hair, help out with different kids and so on. And uh, But I very well think they could be model societies. As you know, I spent uh, time in Tanzania. Yeah, in Africa. Graphic work. And uh, during my uh, uh, NIMH fellowship in medical anthropology. And um, what was most remarkable to me, and, and you're correct, it's, it's a very... Um, egalitarian society of about uh, anywhere around 100, 200 people at most. Yeah. And they are all family. They raise all children all together. And one thing that was most remarkable to me as a psychiatrist was the absence of personality disorders. I did not even know that was You possible. know, uh, uh, somewhere I read that if someone is becomes disruptive in these small groups. They're actually shunned from the group. I, I, I was reading a book, was it, I think, about the Hazda. And that, that's when they start becoming violent. That's when they, when they finally get taken to the psychiatric hospital. But, but so we aren't doing on. that. We aren't doing that in our, you know, whether it's direct violence or indirect, you know, Causing disruptive, you know, causing violence, not necessarily you're actually doing the violence, but you're through your behavioral traits and your conning and your manipulation, psychological, you're causing someone else to do violence. We, it's, it's, if someone does violence, they, we can deal with that in this country, but there doesn't seem to be a mechanism to de kind of catch early on these people who are going to. Oh, yes. Exactly. In those societies, they prevent violence because they actually compensate for others' deficiencies. Uh, uh, people are included in the community no matter what. If there's any problem, uh, even interpersonal problems, the whole tribe sits around and discusses what the solution might be and what the person needs to do to be reintegrated into that community. That's the kind of restorative justice model that they have. The, the kind of antagonism that we have is almost inconceivable to, uh, to those societies. That is the ones that have not been touched by Western uh, colonialism, but, uh, but those happen to be the ones that I studied. And, and that's very true. They could be uh, very much a model for mental health, societal health, and uh, democratic, truly democratic oh. governance. Let, let me ask you, this is, I'm interested in this. So we did a lot of work on intermittent fasting beginning in the 1990s. I, when I was at NIH, I never had time to write a book on it, but it was our research that in large part kind of led to the recent popularity of intermittent fasting as a thing. But, um, you know, do you, uh, you know of Robert Sapolsky? No, he did a lot of work on uh, non-human primates in Africa and kind of the social dominance thing, hierarchy and so on. But, and in your experience with these, these groups in, in Africa, what is their eating pattern? Um, do they, 
so here we are eating breakfast, lunch, dinner, evening snacks. So we space out these meals and we're never really get into a fasted state where we have a metabolic switch to from glucose to ketones. Um, in the case of the, it was uh, baboons that Robert Sapolsky studied. I asked him about this and he said, actually, they probably only eat for three or four hours a day. The, the rest of the time they're, they're doing other social, you know, whatever, grooming and what, did you notice like what yes. their, their time window was for eating? Uh, they would eat an average of one meal a day. So there you go. And look at their health, right? It's, it's greatly better than us. Of course, they're maybe more prone to infectious diseases or, they see. would be more prone to malnutrition because of lack of food, oh. but uh, but they wouldn't starve unless everyone starves. So yeah, uh, so th they share their food, and it's a great source of uh, uh, communal um, expression of connectedness. And their general health is better, and their mental health is better. Mental health is definitely better. And um, I've seen 80 year olds who bounce around and climb coconut trees. So uh, they're able to maintain a kind of physical prowess that we we lose. Have you ever thought of joining them? Just forgetting about the... <laughs> I said, go, go to Africa and become a member of the tribe. Well, that was my... That was actually secretly my reason for going in the first place. Oh, really? <laughs> I had had it with, with uh, Western technological and artificial development, but that was my reason for going to Tanzania <laughs> in 1999. Wow, very interesting. Okay, so what's going on with you now? So we should finish up. I know you're, you're busy, but so you started... Um, started this wow sorry i'm scrolling up on my thing uh world mental health coalition right you started that yes yeah can uh, you, can actually you talk it was a little founded bit and i was uh put in charge of it uh yeah. so there were actually many founders um but it formed uh as a result of uh our need to provide an alternative to the American Psychiatric Association, a mental health coalition that uh, that considers societal mental health and intervenes on behalf of society in order to protect societal um, safety and and health. And you had so you have world. Uh, yes, world it world first world. started as a na national coalition. But, and but, but soon, you, uh, but you had, had enough. You you had an important role with the World Health Organization efforts around mental health too. Is that right? Yes, I I would make a very sharp distinction between the World Health Organization and our little. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. I know, but uh, I'm just saying you you ha you had experience. You have knowledge of. Of mental health issues throughout the world, not just the United States. Yes. Yeah. Yes. In fact, um, uh, at first I was uh, giving recommendations on uh, depression worldwide as it was becoming the number one reason for disability around the world. But then uh, my real interest was in violence prevention. And when they put out their landmark report, the World Report on Violence and Health in 2002, I was part of that launch and in making recommendations uh, for countries to implement um, what the findings were on a science-based public health approach to violence prevention, not just based on criminal justice and security. And with your World Mental Health Coalition, are, are you, do you have a so I went to your website, right? Do you have like regular, uh, I don't know what, discussion groups or podcast type things for discussion? Is uh, yes, um, 
There have been some discussions we've held uh, most recently on the three year anniversary of the January 6th insurrection. Mm. Uh, we've also spoken about uh, more global issues such as racism, uh, uh, disinformation, militarism, mm. environment, uh, all kinds of matters that we feel have a large uh, aspect that is mental health related, human psychology related. And so um, uh, people can go to the website worldmhc.org or my my website has a connection bandylee.com. That's B-A-N-D-Y-L-E-E.com. And have for undergraduate psychology is a, a fairly common uh, major, seems like. And have you, is there a way you can get like psychology departments to let their students know about this particular information source? Um, well, so far, psychology students have come to us, uh, students of psychology um, and sociology. We have not directly reached out ourselves. We have, for, ex for example, uh, Declaration of the Freedom of Mind, which a sociology student actually is trying to get the UN to adopt uh, because we have uh, Declaration of Human Rights, but not the right to uh, being, uh, being able to develop a free mind. Huh, interesting, yeah. Okay, Bandy, um, I'll let you go now. I enjoyed talking with you. Uh, this is an area I'm really up on in terms of the, the, the science. And the, but it's, it's obviously something that's important to all of us. Uh, and knowledge is important and being able to uh, evaluate information and, and know whether it can be relied upon or not is very important. And it would be nice if our educational systems from very early on, you know, instills those skills in people, not not just memorize stuff, but be able to incorporate those skills into your, as you move forward in life. Absolutely, integrate and apply. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Okay, bye, have a good rest of 2024. Thank you. Same to you. Yeah, bye.